So here we have the whole kidney. And I think the first thing we'll notice is that there is a renal capsule around about the kidney. So this renal capsule is actually smooth, translucent tissue, somewhat like this acetate. But of course in life it's a dense connective tissue containing fibrous proteins. And it's continuous with the outer wall of the ureter as it goes all the way around the kidney. And when you're dissecting a kidney, this can be peeled away from the surface of the kidney. It's only two to three millimetres thick, it's translucent, but it's very tough. And it's compartmentalising the kidney to maintain the shape of the kidney. Now, as well as that, the renal capsule contains lots of nociceptors. So I'm sure you've noticed that when someone pokes you in the kidneys, it's very painful. That pain is not really coming from the tissue of the kidney. The pain is coming mostly from the nociceptors in the very sensitive renal capsule, which is why renal pain is a very horrible and often extreme pain. So for example, if there was a hemorrhage in here pushing out the way, or if there was a tumour in here pushing out the way, then, or infection causing inflammation affecting the capsule that will cause characteristic renal pain from the nociceptors in the renal capsule. And actually round about the renal capsule on the outside, there's an adipose capsule as well, made of perirenal or perinephric fat. And on the outside of the adipose layer, there's another renal fascia. So the kidneys are very well protected by the renal capsule the adipose capsule and the renal fascia. Lots of fatty tissue around about the kidney to protect it. And we notice on this model that we basically have two layers. The renal cortex on the outside and the renal medulla is made of these triangular pyramid shaped structures. The renal medulla. And we notice that bits of the cortex branch down between the renal pyramids, like this. Here, and here, and here, between the renal pyramids. And these are the cortical columns, the columns projecting down from the cortex. And the outside of the cortex is sometimes called the cortical zone. But then when you start getting near the medulla, that's often called the juxtamedullary, juxtamedullary zone because it's getting near the medulla and juxta means beside. So the cortical zone of the cortex, the juxtamedullary zone of the cortex. And the medulla is actually made up collectively of these renal pyramids. And they have a base along here the base is this longer part going down towards the apex here. And in the apex, lots of collecting ducts are carrying urine down the way towards the renal papilla. So these are the papilla here. There's a renal papilla taking urine down into here. And this is a minor calyx. So here we have a minor calyx receiving urine from the renal medulla, from the papillary, from the papillae in the renal medulla. And these papillae themselves are fed by papillary ducts carrying urine down through the medulla. So the urine is initially draining into the minor calyx, minor calyces. And these are collecting together into major calyces, which are larger, finally draining the urine into the renal pelvis. Before the urine goes from the renal pelvis on down the ureter, on its path towards the bladder. So together, the renal cortex, and the renal medulla form the parenchyma of the kidney. 
a parenchyma. Now sometimes you can get infection in the parenchyma of the kidney and that would be called nephritis. And you can also get infection in the pelvis and the calyces and that would be called pilitis. And in practice these infections normally go together with infection of the calyces, sorry the pelvis, the calyces and the parenchyma and collectively that's called pyelonephritis when there's infection in the kidney usually caused by bacterial infection very nasty infection and I would expect you to respond to that with aggressive antibiotic treatment. Now this part here is kind of the doorway into the kidney it's the hilum the renal hilum and into this go or out of this passes the ureter and the vessels go in and out via the renal hilum and as well as that although we can't see it on this model there's lymphatics and nerves going in and out through this gap the renal hilum and the hilum gives way to a cavity around about here so in a sense the kidney is hollow so I think you can see hollow bits here and here between the renal calyces and between the vessels and this hollowed out bit is called the renal sinus and in life this is filled with the perinephric or the perirenal fat. Now the kidney is also divided into lobes and a renal lobe consists of one renal pyramid the cortex above the renal pyramid and half of the cortical column between one pyramid and the next. So that would be one lobe of the kidney then the next lobe would be there and the next lobe there and so on around about. And the most common number of renal pyramids to occur in a human kidney is actually eight. But the number can vary a bit, so 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 individual renal pyramids would all be perfectly normal, but the most common number is actually 8. About a quarter of people have 8 renal pyramids in their kidney. Now, we want to notice the blood supply in more detail now. You probably notice that round here there's a fairly exquisite patterned arterial system and an equivalent venous system and what's happening here is blood is derived as we've said directly from the abdominal aorta and here it's going into a segmental artery so this is a segmental artery this is the renal artery here and this is a segmental artery here so the renal artery is dividing into segmental arteries and then you can probably notice here that this is going through a renal column between the lobes. Maybe you can see it better here. So here we have an artery going through the renal columns. And this artery derived from the segmental artery is the interlobular artery. The interlobular artery. And then you can see there's an artery here that flattens around the base of one of these renal pyramids and this is called the arcuate artery it arcs arcuate derives from the word bow as in bow and arrow so the arcing arcuate artery and then in this lovely pattern coming off the arcuate arteries we see the interlobular arteries. So the larger arteries were the interloba, these are the interlobular. And then as we go down to smaller and smaller resolution, the afferent arterioles going to each of the renal corpuscles is branching from this 
interlobular artery. And of course we know that the blood goes through the glomerulus and drains in the efferent arterioles and round about the nephron, particularly in the medulla, there's a network of small blood vessels that are illustrated here. And the network of small capillaries around about the tubules in the medulla is called the vasta recta, the vasta recta capillaries. And it's similar with the venous drainage. From the venous drainage here we see the vasta recta capillaries are draining into these small veins. These small veins here, these venules, are going to drain into the arcuate veins, arching around there. The arcuate veins are going to drain into interloba veins. Here we have interloba veins. And this is going to drain back into the larger renal vein down here. So we see the really quite exquisite patterning around the blood supply or the blood supply of the kidney. Now each kidney of course that has many functional units and the functional units of the kidney are, are the nephron. So we've already seen the renal corpuscles up here and the second part of the nephron are the renal tubules. So the glomerular filtrate is going to pass into the renal tubules. There's going to be a first convoluted tubule or a primary convoluted tubule. And then we see these loops, the loops of Henry, loops of Henley. Some dip down into the medulla of the kidney a long way. Others are more superficial. In fact, most of the nephrons only have relatively small loops but the larger so-called juxtamedullary nephrons have longer loops looping down into the renal medulla. And then of course once the reabsorption has taken place, the selective reabsorption has taken place, the nephrons are going to empty into collecting ducts. So there's going to be the loop of Henle, then the second or distal convoluted tubule and this is a collecting duct here. So we can see one nephron draining into this collecting duct and another nephron draining into this collecting duct. The glomerular filtrate, which is near the urine, then goes down into progressively larger ducts, eventually forming papillary ducts before draining into the papule. So that gives us a rough idea of the overall anatomy of the kidney. Somewhat related to its uh, function. Very intricate, vascular, relatively delicate and of course completely essential organ. And we have two of them. So most people can manage fine actually on, on one kidney. In each kidney there's between 200,000 and 2 million individual nephron units. Most of the textbooks say 1 million but there's actually quite a, a variation in that for various reasons. So 200,000 to 2 million of these individual nephron units and the individual nephron units consisting of the renal corpuscles and the renal tubules producing the urine by cleaning the blood.